my name is Dave Walker. I'm a core faculty member here with the uh, clinical psychology program at uh, Washington School of Professional Psychology at Argosy University, Seattle. And I spoke already uh, in this speaker series, and I get to speak twice. Uh, I don't know why that happened that way, but I'm kind of glad because I seem to always have a lot of things to say. Um, my talk is sort of loosely related to the last talk I gave uh, because I had talked last time about work-related stress and talked about the expansion of the DSM-5 and raised some issues historically in relation to the Hiawatha Asylum uh, for Insane Indians, uh, which, uh, where we also had a lot of labels going on people, and I, I kind of developed a really sort of lengthy bridge, I think, uh, and tried to do so in an hour, and I don't know how successful I was. But today, I've, well, yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, so here we are. I can report to you that the petition from the DSM-5 reform uh, group that I mentioned has been received by the task force for the uh, American Psychiatric Association's DSM-5 uh, group, and it has been rejected. Uh, despite having 12,000 signatures and the support of 14 divisions of the American Psychological Association and all of the various organizations that I mentioned to you last time, I actually passed around a sheet with all these organizations on it, it's been rejected. Uh, the request that was specifically rejected was to have out, outside review of what's going into the DSM-5. So uh, that said, now there's a new controversy about that rejection. So we can kind of watch that unfold. But where I'm going today is on to a somewhat different topic than uh, looking at labeling and looking at uh, labeling the experience of people undergoing stress in the workplace and this sort of thing. Uh, I'm going to talk about antidepressants and I'm going to focus my comments to a certain class of antidepressants, the most popular ones, the SSRIs, uh, Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitors. And, uh, uh, I could talk about some of the older classes of antidepressants. There's something called tricyclic antidepressants. I won't be spending much time on them because they've been mostly displaced by SSRIs, although you see them, uh, you see amitriptyline being used uh, periodically with people still. Uh, but I, my talk today is kind of technical for those of you who are not uh, uh, as into sort of scientific research. That there's a method to my madness in what I'm about to present. Um, it's very difficult for someone like me who's known as somewhat of a curmudgeon to take a position and say, in my service agreement with my clients, I don't recommend the use of, nor do I get involved in managing medication, psychiatric medication. And I actually have an informed consent form that, that my clients review. And, and, so, and sometimes a question comes up from people who have used SSRIs or other psychiatric medications. Well, that helped me or, or it helped me in this way or that way. How come you don't get involved with that? It'll become more transparent why I don't in this talk. But I'm not here to second guess the experience of anybody here who's with me who may have felt that they were well served by these medications or some family member was well served by these medications. I'm actually here to question the scientific uh, research that goes into the support for those medications. Okay, that's where I'm coming from. And we don't often, in taking a stance like that, think of uh, ourselves uh, in, the, in the clinical psychology world uh, as necessarily having a strong enough leg to stand on, okay? And actually there is a very strong leg to stand on and I hope to sort of surface that for people and question some suppositions around these medications. I first got involved uh, in questioning the use of these medications in my own uh, clinical practice uh, while I was working uh, in Indian country uh, full time. And a number of incidents happened. Uh, one of them was uh, nine children uh, overdosed on a tricyclic antidepressant on a elementary school playground. Uh, and that had come, actually, the medication itself had come from our clinic. So I was quite horrified by that event. It was being distributed by a young guy uh, on behalf of you can get high off this, this medication. And so we had a bunch of overdoses there. About three weeks later, uh, we had a suicide uh, in the reservation community of a 10-year-old child who had been placed on SSRI antidepressants at twice the adult dosage maximum level. 
Uh, and I was not directly involved in that particular client case, but I did consult on it with the tribe and pointed out there were some disparities around how dosage was being done. I'm not a psychiatrist, you know, so for me as a clinical psychologist to question the practices there immediately amped up a certain displeasure. <laughs> because after all, I'm not trained to uh, give advice along these lines. And so I did anyway, uh, because I was becoming more and more aware of um, uh, some phenomena that were emerging uh, around these, uh, these uh, medications, in particular uh, suicidality uh, uh, and also the idea that, that maybe they were not particularly effective. Okay? So where we begin is with our tiny bubbles. And uh, I'm going to try to stick to my notes uh, so I can have time for questions. I, uh, I'm usually um, navigating away from my notes, but I'm going to try to be good today. We can begin by talking about the scientific credibility of the serotonin imbalance theory. Many of you may have heard this as chemical imbalance or you know, the idea that uh, when you are depressed, you're experiencing a brain-based chemical imbalance. And the chemical we're generally referring to is serotonin, which is a very, very broadly involved neurotransmitter. It's involved in sleep and waking, and it's involved in motivation, and it's involved in all sorts of things having to do with mood state, um, but very widely uh, spread uh, 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 neurotransmitter. And the idea behind an SSRI is that it's supposed to, uh, when you say it's a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, it's supposed to inhibit the absorption of serotonin into the cells, the neurons, okay, and keep that fluid in between the cells rich with serotonin. And this is theoretically uh, will then alter the mood of the individual and cause them to be less depressed. Okay, so that's the idea there. So um, that being the idea, I thought I'd put a nice graphic up there. And I don't know if I have enough of these to go around, but we're gonna do a little exercise here in regards to that theory. I need five people who are willing to be a marketing representative for the pharmaceutical industry. Okay, all right, I've got three, four, that. five, five, okay, all right. You're all marketing. The rest of you are scientists, okay, research scientists. Now, what I'd like to have, we'll just do this sort of a call and response thing. And I, what I'd like you to do is, uh, I, we'll start at the front here. Who's, a market, who's my closest marketing representative? Right here? Okay, great. So I want to mention again to you about the serotonin imbalance theory of depression. We have this nice graphic. This is the kind of graphic that you often see in presentations like this, by the way. And I'd like to begin by asking you uh, to explain to us what this theory is all about. And we have an explanation regarding Lexapro. So you're our Lexapro uh, representative. Go ahead and help us out. Okay. Lexapro appears to work by increasing the available su supply of serotonin. Here's how. The naturally occurring chemical serotonin is sent from one nerve cell to the next. The nerve cell picks up the serotonin and sends some of it back to the first cell, similar to a conversation between two people. In people with depression and anxiety, there is an imbalance of serotonin. Thank you very much for that uh, erudite scientific explanation. Now, I'd like to go to our first scientist. Who's our first scientist? Here you go, Pam. Go, and let us know who you are, represent there. Go ahead and give us the next quote. The quotes from scientists are in straight, straight face there, bold face. What do you want me to read? I, I want you to read, uh, you're gonna read, it's a kind of a call and response. You read the next one. Okay, the fact of the matter is that there never was a consistent body of evidence to support the theory. George Ashcroft, who was one of the pioneers in serotonin research, abandoned the idea of lower serotonin levels by 1970. Holy smokes. And who are you, by the way, over there? Are you over there? I'm Professor Lumen McHenry. You are. California State University, Ethical Issues in Psychopharmacology, Journal of Medical Ethics in 2006. Okay, great. Now, thank you. So, we need a Selexa representative. Who's one of my, go ahead. Alexa helps to restore the brain's chemical balance by increasing the supply of a chemical messenger in the brain called serotonin. Thank you very much. That was well read. And who will be our next scientist? Go ahead, Carlos. Although it is often stated with great confidence that depressed people have a serotonin or norepinephrine de 
deficiency, the evidence actually contradicts these claims. And who are you representing? Uh, Dr. Elliot Valenstein, Professor Emeritus of Psychology and Neuroscience, University of Michigan. Former chair, University of Michigan Biopsychology Program. Huh. Okay, great. Thank you. And um, we need a representative for, marketing representative for Prozac. Jeffrey. I'm Eli Lilly from uh, 1998 January Prozac <laughs> Advertisement People Magazine. And when you're clinically depressed, one thing that can happen is the level of serotonin, the chemical in your body may drop to help bring serotonin levels closer to normal. The medical doctors now prescribe uh, most often is Prozac. Mm hmm. Okay, great. Um, and let's get another response from a scientist. Go ahead. Okay. I spent the first several years of my career doing full-time research on brain serotonin metabolism, but I never saw any convincing evidence that any psychiatric disorder, including depression, results from a deficiency of brain serotonin. And who are you? Dr. David Burns, psychiatric researcher, winner of the A.E. Bennett Award from the Society for Biological Psychiatry for his research on serotonin metabolism, 2003. Goodness gracious. Okay, and we got one more quote there. Maybe we need one more scientist uh, who could read the next quote. A serotonin deficiency for depression has not been found. And who is that? Dr. Joseph Glenmullen, clinical instructor in psychiatry, Harvard Medical School. Fantastic, another marketing person. Go ahead. When the while the cause is unknown, Depression may be related to an imbalance of natural chemicals between nerve cells in the brain. Prescription Zoloft works to correct this imbalance. Oh, so now it's maybe. Yeah. Okay, so we went from 1998, which sure is, uh, in Eli Lilly, and maybe in 2004 with Pfizer. Thank you very much for that. Who will be our next scientist? Go ahead. Need a scientist. In okay. truth. The chemical imbalance notion was always a kind of urban legend, never theory seriously propounded by well-informed psychiatrists. Okay, that's your so Ronald Pies, MD, editor of Psychiatric Times, 2011. Mm, okay, one more marketing person. Go ahead. Chronic anxiety can be overwhelming, but it can also be overcome. Paxil, the most prescribed medication of its kind for generalized anxiety, works to correct the chemical imbalance believed to cause the disorder. Holy smokes, okay, that's from GlaxoSmithKline. Who's our last scientist? Anybody? We have hunted for big sample neurochemical explanations for psychiatric disorders and have not found them. Oh my goodness, I can't imagine, but we would be totally confused by the difference between the marketing materials from pharmaceutical manufacturers and some of the experts who seem to have a completely different point of view, huh? So when we start to delve into this, uh, one of the things that, that we want to come in with is that the theoretical grounding for antidepressants is shaky. Okay, we want to kind of hold on to that very thought. Okay, and now I'll tell you about Irving Kirsch. He wrote a great book, just came out about a year ago, called uh, The Emperor's New Drugs. Uh, and uh, one of his um, uh, claims uh, is, of course, that uh, antidepressant medications aren't particularly effective. Uh, he started that research around the time I was working at Indian Health Service, and I was mindful of that research as it came out. Uh, Kirsch's research uh, looked at uh, the original uh, FDA, Food and Drug Administration database, uh, at thir 38 random controlled trials, which are the uh, uh, sort of the, the, the top form, the, the classic form of, of clinical tests for drugs. Uh, a comparison, uh, these are comparison trials uh, when, uh, where the individuals get uh, the antidepressant medication or a placebo. How many know what a placebo is? Do I need to talk about, okay, we're talking about sugar pill, whatever. And uh, they do a comparison and the researchers themselves don't know who's getting the placebo or the antidepressant. Okay, everybody's with that? Uh, he was able through the Freedom of Information Act to get the, uh, these original trials for the most popular SSRIs of the day, about 7,000 patients, uh, and all of the random controls uh, trials uh, uh, used, uh, uh, were used in the initial approval of these six most popular antidepressants. So we're talking about things like uh, drugs like uh, Zoloft, we're talking about uh, Prozac, we're talking about uh, uh, a whole variety. Now, the major 
here that was utilized was the Hamilton Depression Inventory. And you look at people and see how depressed are you on this numerical scale. It's an interview-based scale. And you've, you uh, sum the numbers together, how depressed are you, along a different number of factors. And then you, you know, administer the medication or the placebo to see if there's a decline in that. Pretty simple kind of design there. So what Kirsch found in these studies that were used for the approval of these drugs was that placebo duplicated 82% of the antidepressant response. Across all of these trials that he was able to get a hold of, there was less than an average of a two points difference on the Hamilton depression inventory. And uh, only 43% of the random controlled trials favored the antidepressant over the placebo. Now you only have to get two positive trials in order to be approved by the FDA to use a medication, besides the safety and efficacy kinds of studies that you need to do. Okay, so um, there were numerous studies for several of these drugs. That is, the drug companies had sufficient wealth to mount numerous studies in order to get these drugs approved. So some of the studies uh, were, were negative and were never really reported uh, and uh, that became a source of curiosity we will look at later. So we're talking about the tr a true SSRI response here within this database of almost 7,000 people of about 18%, okay? And the placebo response, about 82%. And it's very difficult to uh, uh, persuade people when you're talking to the general public that the, the placebo response, that is the response based in belief of what I'm taking, that it's going to help me, can be so powerful inside uh, a medication regimen like this. But it is, okay? Now, Kirsch repeated this study in 2008 looking at a, a whole group of what were called the new generation of antidepressants. We have some new versions of fluoxetine, uh, which is a, a Prozac type, uh, that's the generic name for Prozac. Uh, we also have the emergence of something called uh, uh, nefazidone, which was used in uh, the original study that he looked at, but uh, had been sort of revised. Uh, that works a slightly different mechanism because it inhibits the reuptake of serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine. And so in, technically it's really called an SDRNI. Uh, but it comes under the same general class of these drugs. And he only included studies for those medications where he could get the change scores on the Hamilton uh, for all the trials. Now, I've never used the Hamilton depression scale in any clinical setting I've ever been in. And yet it's the sort of gold standard for what's used in these kinds of uh, scientific studies, okay? So I got really curious, well, what does it look like? It is a clinician administered interview format scale. Uh, and I thought, well, I'd like to see it, okay? So I got it for you and I'll pass it around um, because this is what we're talking about as far as the criteria for looking at whether these drugs work or not. And what you'll see is much like some of the other scales we use in measuring depression, you sum it together, you get a total score, and then you're looking to see whether there's change or improvement. So you would like to see a decline in the overall score would signify that the person's depression is going down. And we see that in moderate level of uh, depression that there's very little difference between the two. Also, we see the reality of a placebo effect. By the time we get to more severe forms of depression, there is a significant difference, and it's a statistically significant difference, okay? That is, when we sum it all together and do a good research design, we find that there's a statistical I'm sorry, statistically significant difference between the, the group receiving a placebo and the group receiving the SSRI antidepressant in what the Hamilton uh, depression inventory measures. So it goes, it goes down more for the drug, okay? And that would seem to demonstrate something important, okay? But please bear in mind that statistical significance is not the same as clinically meaningful information. Because when I tell you that that looks like about an average of about one point of the Hamilton scale and you see it coming around, you're gonna see that's not particularly meaningful in the lives of these people, okay? 
So I don't know much about the Hamilton scale for those psychologists interested in psychometrics in this room. I don't know whether that could be an artifact of how uh, when you get to higher levels of rating, uh, how that might uh, affect uh, people who are more severely depressed in comparison to people who are not and this sort of thing. We don't know that much about it. But anyway, that's how things turned out. Fast forward a little bit to a fellow named Fernier. This is an interesting study that was looking at random controlled trials from the FDA comparing SSRIs and placebo that did not use uh, a method called placebo washout. Did I explain that yet? No, I didn't. I know I didn't explain that yet. Placebo washout is an interesting thing to do. That's where you, uh, in the beginning of the study, for the first week, you look at the people who are responding to the placebo, and those people who are responding to the placebo, you say, you're pretty much booted out of this study. Okay? You're, we're not going to look at the, their data. Okay? Placebo responders in the first week are not going to be looked at. Okay? Now, from a statistical standpoint, that does some interesting things. It gives more salience, more valence, more power to what your antidepressant is going to do. If I said to you, in the first week, those who respond to the antidepressant will not be counted. Okay? We'd say, well, that's kind of biased against the drug, isn't it? I mean, what if it's working, right? Okay? But now we say that in this method, which is thought to control for placebo effect and more carefully illustrate the antidepressant effect, but in reality tends to statistically emphasize the antidepressant effect. This has been one of the criticisms. So Fournier said, I'm going to try to control for that. I'm only going to look at studies that don't use a placebo washout phase. And he was able to pull together uh, data on 718 patients. And uh, here we have the Hamilton Depression Rating Scale scores. Uh, for, and this was an article, it was a major article published in the Journal of the American Medical Association. Uh, and uh, what are we looking at here? Uh, we have um, the estimated placebo change on the Ham, this is the average level of change in scale scores here, okay? And we see how the placebo is at higher levels of severity. Placebo is also affecting people as far as change uh, in reduction in their, in their score or, uh, in response to the placebo. And here we have the medication, which is slightly higher okay, in that effect. Okay? The overall findings of that study were that 70% uh, of people did not benefit from either placebo or antidepressant. And uh, here's a quote from the researchers themselves. The magnitude of benefit of antidepressant medication compared with placebo increases with severity of depression symptoms and may be minimal or non-existent on average for patients with mild or moderate symptoms. So this is just an introduction to how some of this research has worked. And it's not particularly strong. Okay? It's not particularly strong. And that's just one of the places I wanted to take you because the next thing I want to focus on is another assumption. Antidepressants should be less risky, less costly, and more beneficial than non-invasive, non-medical approaches. Sounds like that would be a good criteria for us to look at. And we can look at it. And here's a nice little study. And this is the one that was done at U of W. Do you remember that back here, a couple slides back, we do have people who seem to be responding to medication in each of these conditions, especially at the severe levels. Okay? They appear to be responding. All right? And we'll call those people treatment responders. So there's been some studies of these folks who are called treatment responders to antidepressants in comparison to uh, being in uh, just therapy alone conditions. You know there is a lore in counseling and clinical psychology that basically says what? You're supposed to have medication and therapy together because that's sort of the best combination of helping someone, right? right? So this research looks at that. And we're, we're looking at it kind of in an interesting way. Um, what we have here in this nice little UW study uh, is we have um, uh, a situation where we have a comparison between 
a medication condition, which is right here, it's like these little squares, okay, so, uh, and uh, we're looking at people as far as relapsing back to depression. So all these are treatment responders and are receiving different things. They're receiving medication or they're receiving a placebo or they're receiving a kind of therapy called behavioral activation therapy or they're receiving uh, cognitive therapy that's a, a manualized kind of uh, cognitive therapy approach. It's a 12 week long program, okay? Right here, the, uh, everyone was put on placebo, okay? The medication, in other words, was discontinued, all right? And here we see those people who we call treatment responders. They know the difference between I'm not taking the real medication anymore. They start not responding, okay? You see that? Everybody with me? Okay. But look at the folks who are in the other therapy positions here. And these are folks who are in behavioral activation position here, okay, or in the cognitive therapy position, and they're receiving just therapy alone, okay? So they're continuing to respond. Now, are they going to therapy at that time? No, they've already been through therapy, okay? And this is just based on follow-up studies. How are you doing? Okay, how are you doing in therapy? We have a more invasive approach to depression, and we also have a, a more costly approach. Okay, this flies in the face, by the way, of the sort of prevalent wisdom out there that antidepressants are sort of more cost effective. They are not. And I'm leaning here not just on the Dobson study that I'm showing you, but also on the work of a fellow named uh, David Antonuccio, who shared some of these slides with me. He's down at University of uh, Nevada Medical School, and he's a real guru on, on this kind of research. So we also would like to know uh, how, what are the uh, relapse rates among those people who are taking just the antidepressant medication and we see that the relapse rate is actually pretty high. Uh, those with prior cognitive psychotherapy, about 15% will relapse to depression, moderate to severe depression, and those with uh, just taking the antidepressant medication will, uh, about 55% about of them will relapse. We want to ask the question, is there an upside? Is there an upside to SSRIs because I'm being so tough on them today? And yes, there is. There is unwanted psychological side effects. And this is another study that was done uh, in, um, at U of Dub. I'm really pleased with U of Dub in doing this kind of research. This was something done by Bowling and Kohlenberg in 2004. And what they did was they checked in with 161 treatment responders. Remember, these are people who are responding to SSRI. And they also checked in with people who were not treatment responders. They wanted to compare them and how do you experience the use of this medication psychologically, okay? And uh, it's very interesting because what I have up here for you to show you uh, are the unwanted psychological s side effects uh, of the uh, of the non-responders, okay, but, uh, and I don't have a separate one for the, for the treatment responders, but I wanted you to see the complaint, the primary complaint of the non-responders to the SSRI. And what is it? Can you make this out over here? Narrow affect. Narrow affect. Hmm. Which begs a question conceptually. It begs the question whether the people who are the treatment responders see that narrowing of affect as a positive thing means like you have narrow emotions, you can't feel very much, you don't have a lot of range to your emotional life, okay? You're just sort of numb, sort of emotionally numb. Yeah, and I had a client one time who uh, told me during a psychotherapy session while she was on an SSRI antidepressant, she said, I really am feeling like I would like to weep right now, but I can't do it. I can't make myself do it. I just know I want to feel, but I can't. Okay, and so this group of non-responders is saying, this is an unpleasant thing for me. I don't like this, this, this feeling. Whereas uh, maybe, you know, and I don't know what literature's out there. This is, I've not seen many studies done like this uh, that would help us understand whether, it wouldn't be a great dissertation right there, whether that narrowing of emotion, that narrowing, that numbness uh, is attributed positively by those responding to the SSRI. Okay, look at all the other stuff up there, by the way. Um, you know, about, uh, we got about 45% of people who were non-responders 
uh, saying that this, uh, this was the primary reason that they quit this drug, but almost 35% saying, I didn't feel like myself, uh, people reporting loss of creativity, an inability to cry, a sense of apathy, and this goes all the way down uh, to all sorts of other little things uh, that they complained about. So wait a second now. What I've said is there seems to be some unwanted side effects. There seems to be some additional cost. They don't seem to be particularly effective. Here's another assumption. An antidepressant should not make you want to take your own life. Don't you think that seems to be a pretty good <laughs> assumption? Right. And you know, I became aware of this issue while I was at Indian Health Service and after the terribly tragic suicide of that uh, child who uh, was, like I say, only 10 years old, and had only been on this dosage of uh, twice the adult level of, of Prozac for about three weeks when, when they took her, their own life. There have been anecdotal reports of dose-prompted intense suicidal and uh, homicidal promptings in a subset of people taking antidepressants, not just SSRIs, uh, since the mid-80s. Okay, and it come up and come down in the popular press and this sort of thing. But a fellow named David Healy in the United Kingdom, uh, his psychiatrist, uh, looked at the original research, uh, the original clinical trials on SSRIs and deduced uh, that the suicide risk per 100,000 people was uh, 3.4 times higher than the general population and was attributable to the antidepressant itself, okay? And this was because he was looking at healthy trials, you know, they do the safety and efficacy trials for these, so he was looking at trials of people who were not being studied for depression but being studied for the safety aspects and finding this elevated suicide rate, okay? And this was scandalous, okay? Everybody pushed back. Now, Interesting thing about David Healy, he gave a talk at the University of Toronto, he'd been hired as a faculty member, and he was using medication with some of his clients, he's just very conservative about its use, and he's talking about this finding, okay, and he was being offered an, a position with the faculty there, and they withdrew their offer of a position on the basis of this research that he had brought out. And he got really mad because he sold his house in Wales and he was about to move there uh, to Canada. So he sued them and he won and he made them hire him as a basis of the suit and pay him $200,000 and then he quit. <laughs> I kind of like David Healy, okay, he's kind of an interesting guy. He's still around. What happened was the reanalysis, uh, there was a reanalysis and replication of his original uh, work worldwide, which led to limits and even bans in Canada, United Kingdom, New Zealand, Australia, Germany, and other places. The FDA was very slow to react to this and eventually acknowledged suicidality was twice as high among adolescents and children taking SSRIs than those taking placebos. There is ample evidence of uh, Richard DeJandre, I can give you the reference, uh, of a conspiracy, really, at Eli Lilly to suppress evidence of the suicide potential of Prozac in particular, okay? So they really went out of their way, they acknowledged it, uh, and then, uh, then they tried to keep it out of the press. Looking at that actual, those FDA reanalysis of the original antidepressant trials, we do see that here's the odds ratio right here. And look at the TAD study. The TAD study is a more recent study that stands for the treatment of, for adolescents with depression. It's a National Institute of Mental Health study. And what we see here is a, a variety of conditions. We have a combined uh, cognitive behavioral therapy and fluoxetine, which is the generic for Prozac. We have fluoxetine alone. We have cognitive behavioral therapy, we have alone, and we have placebo alone. Look at, the, by the way, the, the extent of that placebo effect. It's pretty strong. You can see that for yourself. And you can begin to wonder how big a piece of that is here. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's what you should always do when you're looking at this kind of information. Here's cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, by the way, right there uh, alone. And uh, we, see, we see all this as the acute response. So what we're looking at in that study is a, uh, a placebo response that is, uh, placebo response is about 86% in this study on the children's depression rating scale. And the true phylox phyloxetine 
uh, response is about 14% in the TAD study. Harm-related adverse events were something that the researchers were pretty upset about because they were working under a big grant from Eli Lilly. And they found that they had about twice the incidence on, in the conditions uh, using fluoxetine of harm-related adverse events. They widened the definition of that. So anything from suicidal ideation to trying to cut yourself or trying to uh, uh, kill yourself or kill other people uh, was called a harm-related adverse events. And there was about twice the incidence uh, in the conditions where uh, the uh, uh, kids were, adolescents were on the fluoxetine as in the uh, no fluoxetine conditions. When we look at uh, psychiatric adverse events, which is something a little bit different, we're talking about reports of irritability, uh, reports of manic behavior or chronic fatigue even, we see a much higher incidence of those kinds of adverse events uh, while on the fluoxetine, up to about 18% of the kids reporting that, and uh, somewhat more in the, um, or somewhat less, I'm sorry, in the combination treatment, which there were some inferences around the idea that the therapist could talk to you about those adverse events and help you sort of cope with them as you were going through them, so that was one explanation for that. We also see, of course, people reporting adverse events while they're on a placebo. That's interesting. Okay. That's pretty interesting in itself, we don't know why. People don't report very many adverse events while they're just in the psychotherapy condition. So now we see another kind of circumstance where, uh, where uh, we're, not, we're not seeing that, uh, that kind of harm related stuff going on. Um, here's a, another slide, gotta look at this one kind of carefully. This is comparing combined uh, response to a 36 week follow up, looking at the changes over a long term experience with these various conditions and in principle, we want to say, well, like we've always said, the combination of medication and psychotherapy is somewhat better than CBT alone uh, or just fluoxetine alone, which are about the same. But where you would be making a huge mistake is not looking between the lines and realizing this is a product of placebo washout, okay? And we don't know how much placebo goes into this, right? So. Remember I came, when I sort of rewind you back, it's about maybe 14% of the treat, of treatment there. Now understand, we gotta say that CBT also has a placebo effect, okay? People say, I'm coming to talk to somebody and I feel better, okay? Uh, but look at this, this is not taking any medication and the difference between not taking any medication and the combined approach with all those adverse aspects to it is only about 5%. So now we look at suicidal events in particular. Holy moly. When we look just at the fluoxetine condition, we see a rate of about 14.7% and the researchers were scared to death by this finding, okay? Uh, when you're only taking the drug itself, had about almost 15% of the kids engaging in suicidal behavior while they were on it. And when they were in the CBT condition, about 6%, okay? That's CBT alone, that's not combined. Here we see a slight increase, not statistically significant, in the combined condition, and we can wonder, is this because the therapist can talk to them, give them coping mechanisms for their suicidal uh, behavior and this sort of thing? But are we then talking about in the combined circumstance, which is kind of like I'm saying, sort of the traditional way people think, actually it's more hazardous and that we need to do more kind of checking in and making sure this kid doesn't get more suicidal while they're on the antidepressant. And we'd be safer if we were just in the psychotherapy alone. That's what the kind of question that the researchers actually did not address. They said this phenomenon was an aspect of adolescent depression and how it works, okay? And I think they probably did have to say that given their funding sources. What about sex? And I always can perk up people's interest, especially at lunchtime, as the blood sugar starts to hit in, and you've all come in to see me, and I so appreciate it. I'm talking along here pretty fast, but if I say sex, I know I'm gonna get your attention, okay? <laughs> Wouldn't it be depressing if antidepressants interfered with sex, okay? Right. <laughs> <laughs> and so, let's take a look at that. Here's a wonderful little study 
uh, done of quite a lot of people, about a thousand people. The data was collected in Spain. Uh, it was reported in the Journal of Clinical Psychiatry. It did not receive much general media attention, but it was there in Journal of Clinical Psychiatry. Didn't hear much about it. Uh, they looked at people who had previously normal sexual functioning, or reported that, who were being treated now with antidepressants. And uh, they were asking them about sexual dysfunction uh, in their lives within two months of starting the antidepressant. They interviewed 610 women, 412 men. They used the psychotropic uh, sexual function questionnaire, which I don't even know what that is, okay? Uh, and 59% reported sexual dysfunction. 62% of men, 57% of women reporting this dysfunction. That would be kind of depressing. And people might turn to solutions, and there are pharmaceutical solutions for sexual dysfunction. It just so happens that in another end of our business, we're able to offer you a whole variety of things that you can choose from. In fact, there are things now for women. We can help women with sexual dysfunction. And there's an evidence, did you know that women's sexual dysfunction is an underdiagnosed area? It's underappreciated. We're not being giving sufficient attention to women and sexual dysfunction. So we need to do that now. Because it seems as though we're getting a rise in that phenomena. And isn't it time we started to respond to women? It's not fair. It's not egalitarian of you not to respond to the sexual complaints of women, right? Which have been potentially, what, induced by antidepressants, okay? And here's some of the reports across the six major drugs here. Uh, depending on what uh, you look at, anywhere from 25 to 50 percent of people taking antidepressants. Look back at the research I already told you about and ask the following question. Aren't these drugs better for you if you don't want to have sex? Okay, they seem to have a stronger effect in that area. Okay, and believe it or not, they have been prescribed uh, in a certain sexual offense uh, circumstances, forcibly uh, prescribed uh, by a certain uh, court order uh, kind of situations. That has happened because of that ability to bring about that effect. So where have we been? The evidence-based practice regarding antidepressants. They're not based on any sound biological theory. They're not too much better than a placebo. Okay, there are these people who are these treatment responders, but we have these tools being used in measuring them that are somewhat questionable. There's more risk of adverse events and side effects compared with other treatments. They may increase suicidality. They may make clients irritable, manic, fatigued. Uh, many people report unpleasant psychological side effects. They actually interfere with sexuality more effectively than depression. And we can wonder, does this phenomena even potentially generate depress depression in some people? The idea of not being able to perform or have fun in a very important part of your life, okay? And we could say with all that they're up against, how do these SSRIs remain so popular? Because they are really, really popular. And I mentioned some of this last time I spoke, but uh, five, of the ten top, uh, five of the top ten prescribed medications in the United States are antidepressants, SSRI, antidepressants at that. One in eight Americans has taken antidepressants in the last ten years. One in four women uh, aged 40 to 89 is currently on such medication. The revenues for manufacturers resulting from antidepressant sales are $13 billion worldwide. There was a 400% increase in the use of SSRIs between 2005 and 2008. And the primary mechanism for people to obtain an antidepressant is through a meeting with who, their psychiatrist? General practitioner. There you go. And that's been the marketing strategy of the pharmaceutical companies all the way along to completely bypass the mental health folks, okay? And bring that to the primary care physician through marketing, your television commercials, your little bubbles, and your serotonin explanation. And that's exactly, that's worked very well. But we could hope that those primary care physicians would turn then to their professional journals and say, by gosh, I'm gonna read up on this stuff before I recommend it to my clients. And so if they were to do that, Turner did a nice little study here where he looked at the reporting in the psychiatric and primary care journals of the original FDA trials for these various medications that you see all along the bottom here. They're numbered from one to 73, okay? Well, Turner discovered that there were some missing trials in the literature, and so let me put them in there for you. There you go. 
<laughs> Whoops. So this, these things were, not all of them were published, okay? And when you see the actual breakdown by drug in the review, you find that, well, there are some that get a little bit more positive review, but they, all of them had negative findings in the original FDA. So this is what the FDA has seen, not what the general public has seen, typically, except for the Turner study. I feel, as a licensed psychologist in the state of Washington, that and from an evidence-based practice standpoint, that I do have two very solid legs to stand on in saying I don't recommend the use of, nor do I manage the use of antidepressants. And that's pretty much where I'm coming from, and I've showed you as much as I can about why and the time allotted. And I want to thank these folks for, for helping me, and thank you very much. So, hey, I ran out of time, but I did it. I, and you all came, and thank you so much. I really appreciate it. <laughs>